Hello everybody and welcome to our October Linea webinar, which has proved to be popular with over 70 people registered for it. My name is Jennifer Schulte and I am the Linea Research Fellow. As many of you know, Linea is the learning initiative on social norms, sexual exploitation and abuse of children and adolescents. We are based at the Gender Violence and Health Center at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Our aim is to foster, foster the use of a social norm change approach in the primary prevention of sexual exploitation. As part of Linea activities, we organize webinars every couple of months dealing with diverse aspects of social norms, sexual exploitation, and other forms of gender-based violence. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, you can sign up for the Linea Network to receive future communications about our activities Good afternoon, and welcome once again to our 1400 Lunch and Trade Service to London, Kent's Johnson. At linea at lshtm.ac.uk. Also, I would like to let you know that today's webinar will be recorded and posted on our Linea YouTube channel. And finally, you can follow Linea on Twitter at lin Linea, capital letters, L-I-N-E-A underscore L-S-H-T-M. I'm pleased to introduce you to our fantastic presenters. Today we have Dr. Carrie Jo Clark, who is Associate Professor in the Hubert Department of Global Health at the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. Dr. Clark's research is focused on the health effects of exposure to child maltreatment and intimate partner violence and the design and evaluation of violence prevention strategies. We also have Gemma Ferguson today, who is Technical Advisor at Equal Access, a development communications international non-governmental organization headquartered in San Francisco in the United States. Gemma has a radio production background, having worked as a producer for the BBC, but she has also been working in the field of development communications uh, and communication for social change over the past 12 years. We're very fortunate to have Carrie and Gemma today to share with us their fascinating insights and results from the Change Starts at Home program intervening on social norms to prevent intimate partner violence against women in Nepal. At the end of the presentation, we will have time for questions and answers, and we will welcome everybody's questions and comments. I will hand over to Carrie and Gemma, and we will get started. Thanks, Jennifer. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today, and also thanks to Linnea for hosting us. Um, my name is Gemma Ferguson, and as Jennifer mentioned, I work for Equal Access International which is a Communication for Social Change, INGO, um, along with my colleague, Dr. Carrie Clark from Emory University. We'll be talking today about Change Starts at Home, which is a three-year project aimed at preventing intimate partner violence among couples in Nepal. The project's funded by DFID through the South African Medical Research Council as part of DFID's What Works to Prevent Violence Against Women initiative. As research and learning is a huge focus of the What Works initiative, um, the intervention is also part of a randomized controlled trial, which Carrie will be talking about next. Um, Carrie will also be discussing how we set about measuring norms quantitatively um, and the utility of our early findings. As the practitioner in the team, I will be focusing on our intervention design and how we approached it from a norms perspective. So before I hand over to Carrie, um, I just wanted to spend a few minutes talking about the context and motivation for the change project. Intimate partner violence, or IPV, as we'll be talking about it from now on, is a huge issue in Nepal, with almost a third of women in the country reporting having experienced IPV in their lifetimes. Nepal is a highly patriarchal society where women's roles are restricted and gender inequitable norms are pervasive. There is growing evidence of the role of social norms in perpetuating violence, uh, women's risk of violence, and what we call multi-component interventions, which incorporate many different aspects, um, such as this one, and, and multi-component multi interventions that incorporate radio, like ours, have been shown to be somewhat effective in shifting gender inequitable attitudes and norms, and also preventing violence against women and girls. But Despite this growing evidence, uh, norms have rarely been examined in quantitative research, and there have been few rigorous studies of violence prevention interventions in Nepal. So it was into this gap, um, both in terms of 
study in Nepal and interventions in Nepal and around norms uh, that the change project was designed and launched. Um, I'm going to hand over to Carrie now who will talk um, a bit more about the study and then I'll come back talking more about the intervention later. Carrie, over to you. The Change Starts at Home project is a cluster randomized controlled trial set in three districts in Nepal, Nawalparasi, Chitwan, and Kapilvastu. Across these three districts, we're working in 36 village development committees. Our primary outcome, 12 month experience of physical and or sexual IPV is being measured among a community-based sample of reproductive age women. We're also following a cohort of female radio listening and discussion group members and have several qualitative components, including following couples who are participating in the radio discussion groups, their family members, and leaders in many of their communities. We're also capturing radio listener feedback through an interactive voice response system and are conducting an intensive process evaluation. Our attempt at measuring norms started with an extensive literature review. Much of the extent knowledge on IPV specific norms derives from early cross-cultural analyses of anthropological data and feminist scholarship. More recently, the literature has involved large multi-country analyses, particularly those done by Lori Heisey, that aim to examine the issue more quantitatively. From these various endeavors, a number of norms have been identified, including men's dominance over women, acceptance of wife beating, and appropriateness of violence to solve conflicts. And you can see many of these on the slide here. For our team, the next step is really understanding these issues in more depth, in depth in Nepal, through formative and baseline research. Through our findings, a number of the same constructs were exemplified that were shown on the previous slides. Our next task was really to figure out how to measure the construct quantitatively as our primary outcome was measured on the community-based survey mentioned earlier. In the absence of an established measure, we pilot tested an initial approach. We attempted to measure what the person did, what she thought others did, what they thought others expected them to do, which is in case, in part, what the literature was telling us to do. I'll be honest, we failed miserably in this approach. We had too many items. They came across very similarly to the respondents. We knew we needed a simpler approach. So what we did was we devised an eight item scale that tapped into many of the constructs on the previous slide that we had found through our formative and baseline research. You see many of the example items there. While it is somewhat risky to add sanctions to the items, we did this based off of the formative research and with the intention to ensure that the items would be perceived differently from the attitudinal items we were also measuring. The partner violence injunctive norm scale is correlated with our attitudinal items at about 0.3. So in general, we have achieved one of our goals, to be able to differentiate between attitudes and perceptions of what's going on in the community. There's additional testing to be done to see how this scale functions over time. We have examined its ability to predict women's experience of IPV to see if it functions as intended. As you can see from this figure, <clears throat> we used a multi-level logistic regression to examine whether our measure of injunctive norms predicted women's experience of intimate partner violence at baseline. And what we found was that we did find that it, it predicted women's experience of violence as we would expect. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of testing that we still have to do, particularly over time, to see how this measure functions to be able to detect a change over time. But in the interim, we are analyzing many of our, our data in greater depth while we await end line in March of 2018. So as Carrie highlighted, um, we realized very early on in the design phase that tackling social norms was going to prove as important to the success of the project as addressing individual attitudes. By examining, by addressing social norms, it also helps us to be attentive to the broader processes, such as reference groups and the enabling environment, which are crucial in behavior change. So knowing this, we designed an inter intervention that we believe would make a difference by creating new norms that provided a compelling alternative those gender inequitable norms we'd identified as perpetuating IPV within our target communities. Um, on your screen, you should see an arrow with three boxes. Um, and the three boxes that you can see represent the three phases we focus our intervention on. For those of you up on your behavior change theory, um, 
we modeled this approach, I mean, this approach was influenced by the integrative model of behavior prediction and the steps to behavior change framework. So in short, each phase, which is represented by each of the boxes, um, represents three months of programming. So in total, we did nine months intervention. The first phase was the critical reflection stage, where we focused on existing norms and beliefs um, and encouraging critical reflection offering alternatives and highlighting their impact on IPV. The second phase um, targets that really difficult transition from intending to change to actually practicing new norms and behaviors. For this to occur, we focused our programming on a number of key life skills, um, including empathy, critical thinking, managing emotions, effective communication, handling stress, we felt these were the vital life skills that were needed to enable our listeners to make that transition. For example, not only telling men about sexual consent, but also modeling how that conversation might go and the skills that he would need to employ in order to have that conversation with his wife. And then finally, the third phase supports the adoption and diffusion of new norms and behaviors further out into the community to eventually reach that elusive tipping point uh, where a whole community accepts a new norm. And we've called this the big change approach, beliefs, intention, and go. So the previous slide showed the behind the scenes thinking or scaffolding for our intervention, whereas here we see the various components of the intervention itself. Our approach was to target couples, but drawing on the socio-ecological model, we also wanted to address the context within which they existed. So we also included family members, uh, religious leaders, community leaders. We did this through a combined approach of media and community mobilization, which is the approach that equal access always takes in our media projects. So the media component uh, was a 39-week edutainment radio program. And alongside that, we also developed a 40-week curriculum that was rolled out through 72 listening and discussion groups across our three districts. So each week, the episode that was broadcast across the whole community matched um, what we were focusing on in our curriculum. Now you can see right in the center of the poster we have the radio, and that's because radio programming was vitally important to us to address norms change, because it allowed us to model new norms where couples were able to practice behaviors considered um, what might be considered outside the normative, um, but we showed them as being revered rather than shamed. We were also able to show the personal and collective benefits of couples who became closer and more intimate, um, highlight supportive reference groups, and show the negative consequences of IPV on a family and community. These are all very sensitive issues that we were dealing with. Um, and so by doing it through a radio program, we were able to address it in a culturally appropriate way, building the trust of our listeners as we went. Um, and in the final phase, which you'll remember was called the go phase, we used real stories of change. Um, and we gathered these uh, partly through um, having what we call an interactive voice response system. So callers could, listeners could call up the program and talk about things that happened to them. But we also launched a most understanding couple campaign where we asked listeners to tell us why they were Nepal's most understanding couple. We were then able to feature these on the radio and these real life stories supported the new norms that we were trying to portray. Um, in this third phase also, the listener group members were provided with a toolkit of materials to support their roles as community, community champions of the new norms and behaviors in their new community. So you can see this in action on the poster where there's a community film screening, uh, street theaters, and also community dialogues. And all of those were driven by the listener groups. So who were these listener groups? Now, one of the core assumptions of our theory of change was the role of listening and discussion groups in shifting norms by creating a safe, closed environment where group members are encouraged to engage in critical reflection and discussion on the core issues. Here, you can see a photograph of one of our male groups. <clears throat> and in each community, we recruited 10 couples as our listener and discussion group members. Because of like the cultural sensitivities and also some of the sensitive issues that we were discussing and the need to create a very safe space where dialogue was, was encouraged, husbands and wives met separately most weeks for two hours every week for the entire 40-week duration of the intervention. Um, 
During a session, groups would listen to the latest broadcast of the radio program, discuss the content, and participate in group and home-based activities focused on the major theme or learning objective of that week. One second. Every month, the groups would come together for a couple session, so husbands and wives would meet together. And once every three months, they were encouraged to bring a family member for the family session. The sessions were guided by a facilitator who we trained very extensively. Um, and the facilitator followed our curriculum, which included discussion questions, points for reflection, and activities. So through following this curriculum over the nine months, the listener groups were not only spaces for critical reflection on existing norms, um, but they were also venues for life skills building, as, as happened in, in phase two, and a platform for groups to plan their phase three community outreach activities. So these really became the heart of the intervention. And the listener group's members became both the changed and the change makers in their community. Um, I'm going to go back to Carrie now to talk more about the changes we've started to see. Thanks, Gemma. As this is a randomized controlled trial, we frankly monitored, monitored it to death. As you can see from our plan, our monitoring ranged from weekly radio discussion group leader reports to monthly visits to the group to evaluations every three months, all the while harvesting stories of change. From these various uh, data collection endeavors, we noticed a fair amount of change. Early signs of success, we saw that of the people who started the groups, 93% stayed in till the end of the project, and all but one LDG, Listening and Discussion Group Facilitator, completed the program. As you can see from the, the bar chart right there, attendance across all of our intervention communities was very high, even amongst men, which is particularly challenging. From these monitoring approaches, we saw changes in communication, decision-making, division of labor, ability and confidence speaking out against IPV, and equally importantly, we've seen evidence that the listening group members and leaders were being recognized as somewhat transformed, and many of the members and leaders have seen themselves gain status in their community for their roles in the project. Quantitatively, the participants reported change in themselves their spouse in the relationship in as little as 12 weeks, which is the end of the first phase of the curriculum, with gains in perceived change over time. Now, while these data are far from perfect, collectively they suggest the change starts at home intervention is a promising approach to behavior and norms change around intimate partner violence. So um, our intervention finished in March this year, uh, the nine months was completed. And as Carrie mentioned, we'll be conducting our final end line in March next year. If it is, as we hope, successful, then we've got a few things on our wish list, both in terms of scaling up the program, uh, scaling up program-wise as well as uh, the study side. So from a program's perspective, as I mentioned, we have a nine-month curriculum. We have nine months of radio programming. We have a 45-minute film uh, which we produced that was used for the community viewings. We have videos of um, the and scripts for the street theaters that we did. And we also have a training toolkit where we put together all the trainings that we did for the facilitators and also for the um, data collectors. So we've got a, a lot of material and we'd like to use these as a cost effective starting point for adapting the intervention, maybe to other languages, and context, and also scaling it up both within the pool and outside. Um, from a study perspective, we have a lot of data. Um, apart from the randomized controlled trial element, which in itself generated a huge amount of data around norms and other factors affecting IPV at the community level, we also did a lot of monitoring um, and other data collection, including interviews with couples, family members, community leaders. So we would like to dig deeper into all of these and look at social norms reference groups and also the process of diffusion. We saw the beginnings of this at the end of our project, but we're really interested to see how far this could go um, with a bit more research and study into how diffusion happens and what role different um, reference groups play in this. 
so that's our hope for the future, and that is the Change Starts at Home project. Um, I think everyone who signed up, we sent some blurb that has our website on it, so please do have a look. We've got lots of videos there and blogs that we've written about the project if you want more information. Um, but for now, I'll pass back to Jennifer for questions and comments. Thank you very much, Carrie and Gemma. As we can say, see from these, this rich and insightful presentation, uh, we have heard about an example of the targeted use of social norms for a prevention intervention. It's fascinating to hear in particular about their approach to measuring social norms in quantitative research and the use of radio to address gender norms underpinning intimate partner violence in Nepal. Now I would like to turn to the participants. We have a question from Catherine Whitaker. The question is, how did you ensure you were using a community-sensitive design from the start of the project? So over to Carrie and Gemma, please. Um, so I, I'll, I'll take the first stab at that one. I mean, what our monitoring played a huge part in that, and our listener groups were also a huge part in that. Um, we had, before launching the intervention, we knew the journey that we wanted to take our listeners on, which was those three um, phases that I showed you in the presentation. But quite how far we could push it, we, we didn't know when we first started. Um, but what we did was uh, every single week, our listener group members would send back, our listener group facilitators would send back feedback forms. And every, um, every six weeks, we would bring the facilitators together for training and reflection sessions. So that was training them on the next stage of the curriculum and reflecting on how things were going so far. So it was by having this, and as well as that, we also had the interactive voice response, as I mentioned, where listeners were able to call up uh, the radio program. And we had between, at the beginning, around 500 calls a month, but that increased over the time of the project. So we had a wealth of different voices telling us what they thought of the radio program. But our listener groups were our main litmus test. And through these groups, we realized, um, for example, one of the things was uh, around kind of talking about, about, about sex and sexual consent um, and sex between couples, which is a very sensitive issue to address, particularly in these kind of districts of Nepal. Um, we had a couple in our radio drama who originally were just a periphery couple um, where there was an issue between um, the husband and wife and the husband was no longer interested in, in sexual relations and the wife didn't know why. Um, and we heard from our listener group members that they really wanted to know what happened to this couple. This was really important and they were saying that this was getting to the heart of some of the issues that they had and some questions they had around um, you know, sex and, and sexual relations within a, within a couple. So based on that, we built out that couple that were only meant to appear in one episode and we turned them into a long running, a longer running and reappearing characters and they turned out to be one of our most popular characters. So at each stage, we sort of pushed the boat out a little bit more. Um, and we got the feedback that told us we were on the right track. And we were addressing things in a way that um, that our listeners wanted to hear. But at all times, it was very iterative. We never, we never wrote more than a few weeks in advance of where we were in terms of um, getting our feedback. So we were always able to integrate that into the radio programming. Thank you very much. Um, so another design-related question from Amrendra um, Srivastava. Um, was there were there facilitators for each listener group? Were they trained to handle questions specifically on norms? Yes. So there was a listener group. There was for the male groups. There was a male facilitator, and the female groups. There was a female facilitator. These were selected from the communities uh, that they lived in um, and where the groups were based. And we found them through our local um, NGO partner who um, these were, they were people in the community who were maybe teachers or um, already had a, a certain role within the community. Um, and we trained them, like I said, every six weeks. So it was very intensive training, much more equal access uses the listener group and the facilitator model in um, most of the projects we do. But with this one, we train them a lot more extensively than usual because we wanted them to be equipped to be able to answer these questions. And so with each training, we would go through 
exercises from the curriculum that was coming up so that they could have, they could see these activities that they were expected to facilitate they could see them in action they could take part in them and see what worked and what didn't work um, and were comfortable with the curriculum material um, and every six weeks was kind of at the beginning and halfway through every single phase of the curriculum phase of the curriculum so yes we did a lot of training on norms on life skills on um, how to handle difficult questions how to handle sensitive conversations on violence against women across the board thank you that's very helpful and a question from Hannah Kim um, related to outreach strategy. How were you able to market the program and in turn recruit willing participants? Um, I will let Carrie talk about the recruitment on the study side um, and, and the ethical considerations that came in there. Uh, from the, the program side, we, we, we relied very heavily on our um, local NGO that we worked with that was very already embedded within the community. They were not based in, in the center in Kathmandu. They were based out of the districts that we were working in and we specifically chose them <coughs> as a group who were kind of embedded and, and, and well known and trusted within the community. Um, so they supported us on the recruitment side of things. Um, and in terms of listeners to the radio program and kind of promoting that side of things, we used the R our IVR system allows us not only to receive calls, but also to send out messages. So we were able to push out um, messages promoting the radio program to those who had taken part in our original, um, in our original surveys, uh, whose numbers we had and who agreed to, to receive such in information about the radio program. Um, but Carrie can talk a little bit more about the process of, of recruitment from a study perspective because that obviously played a big part in this project. So recruitment for intervention participants followed the same inclusion criteria as we have for our community-based sample. <clears throat> the difference being is that in addition to, to uh, uh, agreeing to take part in the survey, they also had to agree and their spouse had to agree to participate in the intervention. So this additional pretty significant commitment um, made our intervention groups, our listening and discussion group members, a little bit different from their uh, community com counterparts. Um, they were not really different socio-demographically. They were different in terms of um, overall the prevalence of intimate partner violence was lower uh, in the groups. The attitudes were a, a little bit more egalitarian, and they perceived their communities to be a little bit more egalitarian, but not by too much. Um, in terms of being able to get them to participate, so while additional efforts and investment had to be made, we did try to pick participants to minimize some of the challenges that uh, an individual would face uh, to be able to come to group every week. Because the local NGO was very familiar with the communities that, that we were working in, they tried to pick members who lived not too far from um, the place the proposed place for the listing and discussion group session each week because travel, many of it happens by bicycle or by foot. Um, so we knew that the, the participants would not be able to travel miles each week to be able to participate for 40 weeks. So our, our listening and discussion group members are a little bit different from the community members, uh, the broader community members, but not by leaps and bounds. Jennifer, just to say that these are all, you know, they're, they're farmers or they're rural community dwellers and for them to give up two hours a week every week um, and to, for us to have such high retention levels and high um, attendance um, levels was a great achievement of the project and something obviously that you always hoped for but that we hadn't ever dreamed would be quite as high as it was. Okay, thank you. And related, uh, related to the, question around, the questions around data collection, who actually did the data collection? Um, was it the facilitators or external data collectors? Was there a separate data collection team? Yuki Lo has posed the question. <laughs> yes, so we hired a firm specifically for, particularly for the quantitative data collection and, and a good part of the qualitative data collection. In part because this is a randomized controlled trial, we needed the assessment of our primary outcome measure to be separate from individuals who knew what the community were, were the communities were in terms of their uh, assigned condition, whether intervention and control. So to try to keep that 
um, level of, of blinding, we needed to hire an outside party. It's also important to us that we have um, a particular skill set that you need for ethical professional data collection. So the local NGO who implemented the intervention and, and facilitated much of the recruitment on the, the early phases, they don't have skill sets in, in data collection. They have many other skill sets, but we needed a professional firm to come in and do the job uh, of doing the data collection. Um, we also picked a firm that had prior experience conducting um, surveys and qualitative research on intimate partner violence or other forms of violence because it's one thing to be a professional data collector, it's another to have that perspective, the sensitivity, and the understanding of the, the safety protocols that we have to go through and why we follow those through and how to respond to someone who discloses. So we felt pretty comfortable that the organization that we uh, hired, which was IDA, Interdisciplinary Analysis Analyst, in, uh, out of um, Kathmandu did a very nice job for us in terms of collecting the data according to protocol and according to our safety plan. Okay, great. And also related, um, what methods and tools are being used to measure prevalence of IPV in the community? What would you say are some of the pros and cons of the chosen approach? Well, that is a big, big question. Um, the tool that we're using to measure intimate partner violence is the one uh, that all of the consortium members, or most of the consortium members, out of the What Works um, DFID funded consortium, we're all using a similar set of items that are very similar to the, the prior WHO multi-country study, um, behavior-based types of items, uh, also very similar to the demographic and health survey items, which Nepal has had a prior DHS in which these questions were asked nationwide of a representative reproductive age sample. So in terms of um, asking questions that, that seemed like they were from left field, that was not our concern at all because similar questions had been asked of a much larger and much more diffuse sample. Um, but we are using those items. The challenges to using intimate partner violence as a primary outcome is that it requires an enormous amount of rapport to get and safety in order to get proper disclosure. Um, and, and while we are using sort of gold standard measures of, of approaching that, um, it is always the issue that we're measuring self-report and we're measuring self-report of a behavior that is um, stigmatized and shameful and whatnot. So it carries all of those burdens with it. But it's the best approach that we have in order to get women's experiences because we know, for example, like relying on police reports will by far give us an underestimate of the number of, of survivors in the community and will also give us only the most severe cases that end up in official statistics. Very much. I'd like to open it out uh, to people who are on the phone who may not be able to type in a question. Um, for those wanting to ask a question, if you unmute your line by pressing star 7, you could verbally ask a question. Okay, we, we can come back to you again um, if something else comes up. We have a, a nice uh, robust set of questions from, from folks who are online. Um, we had also another question from Yuki Lo from the Freedom Fund. How did you inform the targeting of the intervention in order to make sure that you were reaching the households where intimate partner violence is most prevalent or most common? So one of the first um, aspects of targeting was thinking about the districts that we were working in. So we were working in districts in the Terai region, which has uh, one of the highest rates of intimate partner violence. The other approach that we're taking, which is really a primary prevention approach, so the, the use of radio and the use of communications and the in-depth work with couples is really focused on fostering that long-term change. So the emphasis was not necessarily going for any particular type of household, but it was really this broad-based shift in norms across the community for this longer-term sustainable change that we were going after. It was important to us that for safety reasons, that we did not incorporate anyone into the listening and discussion groups who had a very severe or very lethal uh, type of violence because we could not 
know if the group setting would be beneficial or put the person at additional risk uh, of violence if they were to enter into the, the listening and discussion groups. So while the listening and discussion groups are not violence-free by any means, um, they were not the most severe cases of violence, mostly to protect uh, individual safety. Thank you very much. And Catherine Whitaker has a question that I think is related. Um, what violence prevention skills did the community already have as part of their local knowledge? And what did you learn from local people on violence prevention, if anything? One of the mechanisms that exists in Nepal is a women's groups. So um, these are kind of tend to be the, the first layer of um, maybe not so much prevention, but definitely recourse. If there is violence within the community, then these women's groups go in and, and mediate between between families. I think what we found was has been there has been a lot of focus on you know what to do once violence has occurred uh, within a community, and um, and what we found was that was very much community based. People very very few people um, went to anybody outside of the community. Didn't really use the the mechanisms and the services, uh, the police or, or other legal mechanisms that were available, but kind of turned to their community members. Um, but what we found was that in terms of prevention, there wasn't really very much out there. Um, you know, maybe a little bit of of awareness raising and things like that, but nothing really kind of targeted at the community or at the couple level, which was one of the reasons why we decided to focus the intervention on the couple themselves um, and what they could do to ensure that their relationship was more gender equitable and peaceful. Um, and these were where some of the life skills came in. But what we also found was, um, you know, there was these people didn't, that one of the, the norms that existed and is, is this idea of not talking about, um, you know, violence if it happens. For, for the woman to keep it quiet because of family honor and shame and all those things attached to that. Um, and also sometimes, not always, but sometimes the approach is used by um, the women's groups in terms of, um, of uh, stopping the violence was, was maybe not particularly victim-led. It didn't have the woman at the heart of it. It, was, it could be a, a situation that, uh, that the woman herself was not comfortable with. So some of these skills that we were encouraging, partly for the couples, good communication, listening skills, empathy, um, were also useful for these wider community groups to draw on um, and was also kind of letting the community know that they were you know, a great first response, but if they were to do that, there was, there was particular ways that they could support women more actively, um, both to stop violence occurring in the first place and also to intervene once violence had occurred. Thank you. And within the listener groups uh, specifically, how were disclosures of intimate partner violence dealt with? Um, were they dealt with within the group? Were they reported to law enforcement agencies? Were those who disclosed um, provided information, counseling? How, how were disclosures handled? So I'll, I'll jump in first, uh, particularly with our, our research uh, protocol. But the, the safety plan, and, and this I think speaks to the previous question as well, was really first and foremost to understand what resources were available in the district, informal and formal, resources that could be brought to bear uh, to make sure that we were creating a safe and responsive environment. Um, and so we had, during the project, we had um, access to counselors uh, as backup and that were prepared to be on site as needed throughout the process. On site services were not needed uh, at all through the intervention or the data collection. And there were a few referrals and calls to the, um, <clears throat> to the uh, uh, psychosocial resources and counseling that we had on offer. So everyone in the groups, um, and especially the LDG leader, understood the approach to take if someone were to disclose. So we have a very protocolized way they were to, if, if the utterance was getting very private and whatnot, they were to um, move to a place to have that private conversation um, and allow the group to continue to the extent possible. We also know that the group environment can be uh, a wonderfully supportive, 
first response if the person doesn't need or, or, or need that initial phase of privacy. Often in these small communities where everyone kind of knows everyone's business, whatever's being said is not particularly surprising. But we do have, have a protocol to move over to a, a private space when at all possible. And part of that was also choosing a place like a school, a community center, or someone's home that had multiple rooms or a field where some degree of privacy would be possible. Um, but the leaders and everyone was made aware of resources that could be brought to bear immediately and on a longer term basis um, if they needed some support uh, for their situation. Okay, that's very helpful. Um, and uh, did the evaluation measures include uh, some concerning emotional and psychological violence? And what did you learn about these forms of violence related to IPV? So yes, so we measured uh, economic abuse, emotional abuse, um, in addition to these other forms of abuse. We also uh, measured abuse from in-laws. Um, and many of it is what you see in the literature. There's a large overlap in psychological and physical abuse. Um, economic abuse was not as prevalent as the other forms of abuse, um, as we might have expected a, a little bit more of that in terms of um, uh, sort of women's status and whatnot, um, but the items that we used were very similar to the WHO items, the WHO multi-country items, um, and the economic coercion items were from the uh, multi-country study on men um, in the Asian Pacific. Okay, so we have a number of different questions that relate to program monitoring or to sustainability and then scale up. Um, in terms of program monitoring, uh, how, you know, were, were the radio program listeners the only ones who, who participated in program monitoring data collection, or did you also uh, engage um, those who were not part of the listener group, so trying to get at some of that diffusion beyond the, the listener group? Um, and how far were you able to see uh, any kind of outcomes or impacts even just qualitatively uh, um, without listeners uh, actively engaged in discussions afterwards? That was a, a long question. Um, we just wonder about the measurement challenges of, of monitoring, program monitoring for participants and then that, that diffusion effect that, you, that we hope to see in social norm change uh, over time in, among non-participants. Okay, Gemma, I can take, I would say, part of this and you may or may not have um, want to chime in. So mm -hmm. the monitoring was a multi-pronged approach. Um, we, uh, Gemma had mentioned uh, that the radio listener feedback through this interactive voice response was one way to get feedback from people who were hearing the radio that may or may not have anything to do with any of our particular study communities since we have very little control over where those radio waves go. So there was, there was that active attempt to get that feedback from listeners um, in a way that was separate from um, our listening and discussion group members. Other aspects of the monitoring, um, like my monitoring slide showed, a lot of it was heavily invested in the listening and discussion groups and uh, the listening and discussion group leaders um, and their communities also from a little bit from the community leaders in the area in terms of what how active they were, but in addition to this sort of intervention heavy focused um, monitoring, we also have on our community surveys, which go to this random selection of reproductive age women in the communities, we are asking them their exposure um, and response to the different types of activities, um, the community engagement activities and whatnot. So did they see a community theater? Did they listen to the radio? How frequently did they listen or uh, see these various events? And we also ask who they spoke to about these, um, if they spoke to anyone, friends, family, about the activity um, after the fact. So we are trying to monitor that uh, as part of the survey, trying to pick up from the community members who's listening, who's not, um, and if they are listening or they are participating, you know, who, who are they speaking to? I think some of the monitoring data, especially the qualitative, is also picking up on some um, outward-oriented types of um, not just activities that were held. 
which is really like the outputs, but thinking about how people are being received in the community and how the activities are being received in the community, particularly the community engagement activities like the film showing, uh, the theater, um, the various activities that the LDG members put on in their communities in collaboration with their, uh, their leaders where that was available. Um, and we have some data from how many people showed up at the activities and what they thought of it in terms of some basic monitoring in, in that respect. Um, do we have as much monitoring on the diffusion process as we would like? I don't think so. Um, we are currently searching for funds to, to do a deep dive into the data that we have, but also to prospectively uh, trace this change into the community as a next step onto this process. So while we, we tried to measure every aspect, um, as always, we, we ran into limitations in terms of what possibly we could measure with the amount of resources, particularly personnel, um, and capacities that we had to work with. Yeah, I think I think Carrie has pretty much covered everything there. I think the only other approach that we use to capture views from those who are maybe listening to the radio program but not taking part in the listener groups was at the end of every phase, we sent out IVR surveys. So we would send one out to the um, to the listener group members, uh, and then we would send another out to just a random selection of people from our database. Um, and at the beginning of that, the first question would be, do you listen to the radio program, yes or no? And if yes, it would take them through to uh, a number of questions. And in, at the end of each phase, the questions were were to check where everybody was on that kind of arc of change that we were hoping. So at the end of the first three months, we asked questions around um, changes in norms or, or their understanding of, of norms and beliefs over the last three months. In the next phase, we, we talked about um, any skills or, or new life skills that they'd acquired. And in the last one, we talked about, we asked about um, you know, their, their confidence in intervening within the community or taking steps out within the community or talking more widely on, on the issue of, of IPV with others in their community. So in that way, we were able to um, you know, with all of the of, of the kind of caveats that come with that sort of data, we were able to capture some idea of of the fact, you know, the difference between listener groups, listeners, and non-listeners. Um, and of course, being an RCT in our control groups, um, they were exposed to just the radio program. So when we do get our final um, end line data, we should also have data of those that were in communities that just got the radio program and nothing else as a comparative. Um, along the lines of questions around disaggregation, will you be disaggregating the findings by age? Uh, Rachel Marcus has shared that question and the comment that it would be great to know if there are differences in the ways that adolescents, uh, young women, older women experience IPV and whether the project is impacted on different age groups in different ways. So we have some sub-analyses that are not I'll just put it right out there, not fully powered. Um, but we did set out in our protocol, in our protocol manuscript, that we would be looking in the qualitative and in the quantitative data for signs of potential moderators. Uh, one of them, age, uh, caste, ethnicity is another. Um, we're going to be looking very exploratorily at potential district differences, since we know that one of our districts is uh, socioculturally a, a bit different from the others. Um, so there's an, a number of potential planned um, sub-analyses, uh, subgroup analyses that we will be performing, uh, but all of them will be more of the exploratory nature, uh, in part because we, we are not powered to do so, um, but also because we wanted to leave ourselves open to allowing the qualitative data to speak as loudly as it could, since while it is not as numerous as the quantitative, it has been. Um, incredibly powerful to help us understand what's going on. And so we wanted to, to not presuppose all of the potential subgroups that might be uh, relevant, um, but to leave ourselves open to those potential possibilities in an exploratory framework. Great, thank you. Um, could you just quickly talk about a little bit about the rationale for a 39-week intervention? Um, if you saw change as early as 12 weeks, do you think the intervention could possibly be shorted, shortened uh, in the interest of rolling it out further? It's a question from Claire Howcroft. 
so the um, the rationale between behind 39 weeks was was largely dictated by us being part of a, of a of a three-year project where you needed to have the study component and, and the RCT element of it and also the the um, having to have a third measurement one year after the end of the intervention so there were they were um, kind of limitations on the length of the project and from a um, from a media perspective the longer the intervention the more um, the more change you are going to be able to see because we were launching a radio program from from kind of scratch from cold and nobody had had <clears throat> it's not like you're using um, existing radio vehicle that already has the trust of the listeners so we did have to build up our listener base we had to kind of gain the trust of our, of our listeners and from a purely media perspective i think nine um nine months is is probably the very shortest you could do if you wanted to have a radio program affecting change at a community level um but yes it was very interesting to, to see changes that were happening um, at different points during the intervention and to see it as early as the first three months. I think um, those first three months had a, had a massive impact, particularly on the listener group members in terms of rethinking and critically analyzing some of the, the norms and beliefs that they had sort of just accepted previously. Um, so there are there is potential uh, for kind of taking, and also because the intervention was was divided into those very three distinct um, phases, there is uh, potential um, on a smaller scale, and then particularly if you're working with groups um, that you could use, you know, you could tailor and, and pick and choose parts of the intervention if you wanted to just address certain certain elements um, that we were going for. You wouldn't need to go through the full the full nine months. Um, so it is it is interesting, and that would be something that I guess we would like to look into in further research in terms of what could be achieved from um, taking bits and pieces of the intervention. But, um, but yes, I don't, I do, at the same time, you know, being part of a media organization, we spend a lot of time advocating with donors for the need for, for long running media, media vehicles that can really get embedded into the lives of, of, of listeners. So um, I wouldn't want to, <laughs> to undo any of the good work of my community in, in advocating for that as well. I think I would, I would, uh, second all of that and more. I, I think um, I, I know donors are particularly interested in things that are efficient uh, in terms of time and money and, and all of the above. But you know, the truth is is that the investment in groups and the investment in the diffusion, the latter being the piece that we would actually like to invest more time in, because we know that group work can work, uh, and we saw within 12 weeks, although imperfectly measured. Uh, people self-reporting change in themselves and their spouse and their relationship within 12 weeks. So it's just a nice indicator that there may be some efficiencies to be had, but in the long run for, for long-term embedded change that's sustainable well beyond the program, I think, um, I, I, I think it would be valuable to test this out uh, with uh, you know, a much larger study that could test out the, the different time frames but even just going through the curriculum at the nine months, I think uh, everyone felt that more time, even the, the listening and discussion group members were asking for more time. They were asking for more, more groups, um, and many of them continued to meet after the, the stop of the group because it was something that was perceived to be a, a useful vehicle you know, for achieving some of their personal and also community um, ambitions and goals. So I would argue that you know some scientifically some of our best and strongest interventions are are not even nine months, but you know in the longer term of years and more, uh, in terms of enacting this long term change that in the long term would be more effective and cost effective if we were able to in a matter of a year or two or three to 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 have change that sticks as opposed to that rolls back. Um, you know, soon after the intervention is removed. Okay, thank you very much. We're coming up, but we just have one last minute. So Carrie and Gemma, in this last minute, could you just talk a little bit for us about um, your thoughts on what, a, what does sustainability look like in a context of political turmoil? Um, and 
one last thing, if you have any final thought to share on how do you protect participants uh, in this kind of intervention when you're communicating out your research? Um, okay, I will take the I'll take a stab at the at the first one, although that's quite a a broad question, but a very interesting one. Um, I mean, I think from our perspective, um, the key is is community community led and community ownership. Um, as Carrie mentioned, a lot of the groups are continuing to meet even after the intervention ended. Um, we did a lot of work to, we, did, we haven't talked here much about what we did with religious and community leaders, but we included them in the intervention and then connected them with the listener groups. So we tried to create connections at the community level. So um, you have with the, with the general community and the listener groups, uh, with the listener groups and the religious and community leaders, bringing in family members, bringing in um, the, the facilitators who again have often have more uh, active roles in their community as either local government officials or teachers or things like that. So what we tried to create at the, at the very local level was, uh, was a network that would sustain um, whatever momentum we could start with the, with the programming. Um, and what we, what we saw was that this was, you know, this was all being activated and the groups were inspired to continue having these conversations with people in their communities. Um, family members were taking a very big interest in what was happening to the couples. Uh, religious leaders pledged their support. Um, and so by doing all of this, we hope to kind of create something that could continue uh, without our, you know, without us intervening anymore and us just sort of being the catalyst for that, for that change and momentum to continue at a, at a community level. And I think you know, with all the during the process of this of this intervention, we we did, you know, we struggled with with different political changes in Nepal and um, and also with oil uh, fuel crises and various different different things, which meant that you know, as a as an organisation based in Kathmandu, sometimes it wasn't always possible for us to, to to go and visit our field sites. So we, you know, we put a lot of faith in our on our local partner, and we put a lot of faith and a lot of um, training and a lot of our kind of efforts into the facilitators as people who could really keep this going um, after the end of the intervention and, and everything that we that we created we also passed on to the communities to use as, as they wanted to. So that's well. Carrie, any last thoughts about the protection of identities of, uh, and privacy of uh, participants when you're communicating out about research? Yes, I was going to just quickly jump in, uh, try not to get us over time too much. Uh, but this, I think, was a nice place, uh, sort of a, a junction where the academic and the communications uh, realm sort of met, and I think in a mutually uh, beneficial way, because the, the research brings in enormous protocols and safety protections, you know, and, and then anonymizing data, summarizing data, aggregating data, the usual sort of ways that you know, you you make sure that stories are not identifying, that text is not identifying, and that that things are summarized to a degree that um, you're not highlighting a particular person's case. On the other hand, there's real value in people seeing and using their stories, which is you know oftentimes these very moving stories, like the the most understanding couple and whatnot, which is on the positive side, but it's also you know thinking about change and how some of these individuals change and being able to document their stories and to infuse the programming in an ethical way with the learnings that we're we're seeing about how people are receiving the material. So this really required a degree of, of understanding about how data was going to be used, a lot of foresight and thought and group work about how data are collected and then how they're used or anonymized, and also giving the participants who are lending their voice, who are lending their stories, full control over, over whether or not their stories end up you know, uh, anonymized or, or in their own voice and their own, you know, with their own identity. So I think this, this pairing of the two, the comms and the research, really created an opportunity for people to use their data, their own voice, 
uh, to the extent that they wanted it to be theirs, but also for the most part things were anonymized and, um, and summarized in a way that people were not identifiable. Thank you so much, Carrie. We'll have to leave it there for now. Um, I want to thank the presenters and all of our participants. Thank you so much for your interesting questions. We hope that today's webinar has provided a lot of food for thought. Let's continue the conversation in future Linea webinars and events. Take care and bye for now.